So I'm in cyber defense operations for critical infrastructure defense. And, you know, SANS is the, the world leader in security training. So applying not only what I'm learning in the classroom, but what I'm gaining from my peers uh, in these classes helps me take and deploy that training and that knowledge day one. Everybody, uh, to this and official live webcast about the threat to report that myself, uh, John, and David, we wrote it for you, and we're going to be discussing a little bit about open skills to report as well. Uh, let me briefly introduce myself. My name is Nico, Nico Dagan. Some of you may better know me as the Dutch Ocean guy. I'm a guy. Uh, and uh, my background is over two decades in law enforcement, mostly doing forward and clandestine uh, operations mostly geared towards open source intelligence and counterterrorism. So uh, that's briefly me. Um, David, you want to introduce yourself real quick? Sure. Thanks, Nico. So my name is David Mashburn. So my current role is I'm the Chief Information Security Officer at uh, Embry-Riddle Aeronautical University. So I'm working in higher ed at the moment. Uh, I've got background, though, in uh, big internet companies like Salesforce. I've worked in the federal government space, uh, mostly kind of the blue team role. Uh, so whether it's incident response or security operations, that's where I've been. But of course, we spend a lot of time leveraging OSINT in all those parts of those particular security operations. So with that, I'll pass it over to John Turbush. Hey, everybody. John Turbush. Um, my background is as a private investigator. did that for years. And then some years ago, sort of moved into the information security area. Uh, and now I do sort of threat intelligence work with a company named Recorded Future. I uh, still do some open source intelligence and, you know, all the way back through my days as a private investigator, did a lot of that as well. So um, a lot of experience, I think, here between the three of us from three different directions. So this is why we kind of teamed up together uh, to build out this course. Yeah, yeah. Speaking of which, I think it's it's a good thing to know that we, that we started five eight seven basically back off getting um, teaching uh, SEC four eight seven, which is the fun, fundamentals of open source intelligence, and we got a lot of feedback that people were willing to learn more, more advanced techniques, and this is what got us started as a group together and said, like, "Hey, we can probably write a, a, a course that that will give what people have been asking for for years." David, you wanted to say something. Yeah, I was just going to say, I mean, John's point is really great. I mean, uh, you know, you think about OSINT and the application to all the various realms, and we each come from very, very different backgrounds. Uh, you know, Nico is an analyst in law enforcement. John, you know, is a PI background. Uh, you know, I was more traditional IT coming in, and, you know, we didn't really think about OSINT per se the same way you guys did. We just thought about it as it's a data source, right? But um, kind of coming and putting it together and have these different perspectives, you really see the, the value of that across all the various disciplines. And that's one thing that's so really cool about OSINT is, you know, every time you think about it, it's like, wow, that's, that's OSINT right under the hood, what you're doing. So, yeah, that's particularly what I've been liking. It's like every time, every week, I learn something new. Just the other week, I was at a conference. I met people who are knee deep into open source intelligence, but they, gave me perspectives I've never heard of. And I've been doing this for quite a while. And I was like, that's so smart. And I think that that's something that we were trying to embed in 587 as well. Uh, for instance, uh, for me, 
the introduction to to JQ that you introduced to me, David. I knew about it, but from an open source intelligence perspective, I didn't know about it. So maybe you can tell the audience a little bit about that part that we do. Sure, we can kick off into that a little bit. I mean, you know, one of the things we talk about is the scaling of data collection and analysis. You know, there's so much data that's out there and there are things that are available. And so we go out and we look for data that we can pull in that's relevant to our investigations. Now, in the case of things like what John does, kind of the cyber threat intelligence, things I do in incident response, sometimes we're pulling those data from well-defined sources. It may be an API call, for example. You know, APIs may sound scary, especially to people who haven't really spent much time ever doing any kind of scripting or programming. But frankly, an API is just a standardized way of interacting with a resource. I basically ask a question a particular way and I get certain data back. And so we try to take away some of the com seeming complexity of APIs and just say, look, it's just a way of asking for data from a web page. However, when that data comes back, one of the most common formats you're gonna see is simply in JavaScript object notation or JSON. And we gotta have a way to actually effectively pull what we care of out of that data. Now, if it's relatively small, yeah, it's easy. You can look at it, open up the text editor, pull it out, all the things that you would do, you know, throw in Excel, whatever you want to do. There's no wrong tool to use when you're at a certain scale. But when I get back a million records, eh, you know, or a line with 10 million, you know, a file with 10 million lines and a variable number of records, now all of a sudden I probably want to be a little more selective. I don't think trying to open a notepad is going to give me the best experience. And so that's where tools like JQ come into play. Um, JQ is uh, just a command line tool, but it allows you to very specifically extract data from a JSON document. And of course that ties in nicely with our data source. And so we talk about ways to do that. And with automation, of course, that means we're going into command line. And again, command line can seem scary sometimes, but we try to basically focus on use cases in the class. Say, here's things you're likely to do. Here's a model for you how to do it. And of course it goes from there. And so. Um, kind of kick this back over to uh, John, for example. So John, you know, when you're dealing with your kind of day job and consuming OSINT, I mean, getting that data in a format where you can either use it somewhere in a different tool or put it in a report really becomes paramount, right? Absolutely, yeah. Um, I mean, it's really a matter of scale and expedience and the fact that you can sort of automate a lot of these functions, right? And, and as a private investigator, obviously, I wasn't dealing with much of this stuff at all. But moving into information security, doing threat research, you can really see the value. Uh, and also for, you know, I still do open source intelligence stuff. I'm still out there collecting information. A lot of the, the data that I'm going to dig through and harvest is going to be information on, you know, domains and who is records and all this sort of stuff that it's open source, but you can you can do your work so much faster. You can be so much more efficient, uh, and you can scale up. Like David said, you know, there's no way you can manually go through a hundred thousand records. Like that's that's craziness to even try. Uh, but if you do know some ways to write some scripts, do some coding, it makes it so much easier, and and in some ways makes it even possible. Right? There's some things you just couldn't even attempt to do realistically without using some some tools uh, and scripts and coding. Again, this isn't a course on coding. This is how you can use coding for OSINT. This is entirely the focus of it. So it really is engineered toward, you know, people like myself or Nico or David that w when we're doing OSINT work, that's what right. it's about. And so, Nico, maybe you could speak that a little bit too, because you know when we've got together and started working on this course, you know, you mentioned, hey, I'm not really a coder, and we talked about you and I sat down and kind of talked about, well, what is it? You know, what are your common use cases, and kind of how that applies to an OSINT investigator, because that's really the where your background came from. Yeah, yeah. So, so especially when we sat down, I was talking about, hey, most issues I ran into during my times, for instance, in law enforcement is that I needed to do OSINT at scale. So I've had, I had tasks like a, map out a group of criminals. And uh, with that, you get a very broad question because now you need to, uh, for instance, scrape uh, certain posts on Twitter that contain a certain keyword. But like you just said, if it's like a hundred tweets, it's doable manual, for instance, in Excel. But if you now have, let's say 10,000 or 
maybe a million tweets, and you need to find that pivot point you need to do OSINT at scale. And you probably need tools that can parse through that data to look specifically what you are looking for or what you're aiming for to find that, to basically address that intelligence uh, requirement question. Because it all starts with that. Someone asks you a question or you ask yourself a question that you want to find an answer to. And with that, you grab data. And in this course, we aim for data at scale. And then we tell you, hey, First, you need to make sure that the data, you can show someone that you haven't hindered or tampered with the data by, for instance, hashing it and showing it, hey, this is how we got it at this moment in time. And then you start parsing through it, for instance, and see, hey, what's noise that I can cut out? I do not mean leave out, but just cut out for my investigation and analysis and then start pivoting into that. And maybe you will find that very specific, distinct uh, figure that you now can do a deep dive into. So, yeah, I, for me, graphing out information, making it more visual, especially when it comes to larger data sets, that really helps you move forward more quickly to come to a better understanding. So yeah, that, that really helps me. And, and uh, besides that, uh, also hi to everybody. I see a lot of highs in our chat coming in. So, so thank you for that. Um, Something that I think is also important that we address within this course that I wanted to to let our audience know is that um, I've seen a lot of open source intelligence courses throughout my career. I've followed a couple. Uh, I teach a lot of open source intelligence myself for SANSA 487, 587, 537. Um, but in very rare occasions, I see people talk about the reliability of the information that they collect. So that's something that uh, was also coming back from feedback and ask uh, questions were asked. So we try to embed several methods and ways to for you to make an assessment upon information that you have gathered. So we will definitely not tell you this is the number one way to do it. We are basically telling you, hey, you should at least keep it into consideration because, well, let's be honest on the internet, if someone has a Facebook profile and posts something on it, are you absolutely sure that that's the person that you are investigating who posted that particular picture or thread or whatever? Do you know that that was that person sitting behind the computer? Do you actually know if that person exists if not or not? So we can, we can use all kinds of reliability rating models like ANCH, uh, analysis of competitive hypothesis or uh, crop tests or amid tests to at least stress test the information that we got to make a sure as possible that we can point out to our clients and leadership, hey, this is the information we gathered and collected and sorted and parsed through. And now our recommendation based upon this is this information is most likely to be true or accurate or not. So yeah, I yeah, think I th that's I think, an important thing. I think that's so critical, especially now in this digital age. I mean, you know, when I started out, it was going to the library, going to the courthouse and was a little bit simpler, at least to, you know, analyze information. Well, I got this from the court or whatever. Nowadays, everything online could be put by somebody that compromised somebody's account. Or, you know, we see this sometimes with um, uh, people manipulating stock like happened recently, uh, accidentally or not, where some sort of press release is put out on someone's compromised website or, or some weird data gets out there. And it's so important that you as an OSINT investigator or researcher can analyze that information, really assess the validity of it, assess the source and the information itself. And I, I think it's so great that we go into this because I think this is an area that is not addressed enough in open source intelligence. I mean, the key really is intelligence. It's not just collecting the data it's analyzing it, making sure that you understand it and validate it as well as you can. Yeah. And, I, and John, I wanna kind of pick up and run with this because honestly, this ties back really nicely to the talk about automation. Um, so for example, uh, think about all the data that's out there that, you know, again, you can argue, is it open source and is it not, but things like breach data, for example. And uh, we certainly will take a look at those items as we're permitted to, depending on the uh, environment in which we operate. Uh, but uh, for example, uh, Nico and I talked extensively about the Iron March breach, right? So back, it was kind of a neo-Nazi forum. Uh, and of course, that was a, a very interesting one to investigate. But this was really a case of the, the format in which data came 
was not really readily accessible. It was a dump of a forum database on the back end into a bunch of text files. And while there were instructions on, hey, you can try to put this back into a database and read it, um, I'm gonna tell you from experience, it wasn't particularly easy to do so. Matter of fact, this was a case where um, not only talk about the collection of data, but also the parsing and analysis of data, going through that kind of breach data to number one, actually pull out things that are readable, but then two, to go back and apply the reliability to that and say, okay, well, now that I've found this, can I validate this data in other places? Because uh, certainly in other breaches, you've seen people claim, okay, well, there's misinformation in here. There's fault, you know, obviously false information in the middle of this breach, therefore all of it's false. Now we certainly wouldn't take that position because we want to validate each discrete piece of information as best we could. Um, but sometimes even getting to the point to be able to actually validate the data means I've got to do some manipulation of that data. And so that's why we take a couple different approaches in the class. Um, and I can tell you from experience, I've done this over and over. And a lot of times it's about the matter of giving yourself a framework. I go in, I read some data. Uh, for example, I'll give you a, a, kind of a rundown of the Iron March very briefly here, not to dominate the time here, but so in the profile directory, there was you know, things like email addresses and names, but there's also a section for what they might put as their tagline or signature. And that would often include things like HTML tags, line breaks. Well, when that's in a CSV format, it doesn't really work very well to try to put it back together. And so what I did was wrote a simple Python script using kind of a cross-platform language to try to say, identify what belonged with the previous line if it found kind of odd characters. And I've done this in many, many different domains. I've done it in this in response, I've done it in this type of investigation, but being able to do simple things like that. And the beauty of it is once you kind of figure out how to do those things once, you can have it in your toolbox and use it over and over and over again. Yeah. And so uh, Nico, so kind of let's pivot over, let's talk a little more, bit more about reliability. So I've got a piece, what are some of the techniques I can use to actually do that reliability rating? How do I know something is, you know, we live in the age of fake news, yeah. right? And so yeah. how do I find something that's valid? Well, in, in my honest opinion, it should all be, uh, first of all, is you need to check the source. So where is this information coming from? And when I talk about a source, the source could be the platform as well as the person who posted that. So l let's take a look at, for instance, a major news outlet like BBC or, or, or CNN. Those are both platforms and on those platforms, journalists will post their articles. So that's how I would like to look at the source. Same counts for Twitter. You have Twitter and you have a Twitter account that can post a piece of information. So in most cases, the sources will be reliable unless it's a web page. So with that, for instance, you can look at the top level domain. Is the top level domain uh, a common top level domain for a news outlet? Does it make sense? Does it add up? Uh, also, when it comes to disinformation, I would like to suggest to students, hey, who else is talking about this piece of information? Because if it's something that is generally accepted to be true or picked up by other major renowned news outlets, you will most likely find that same piece of information somewhere else. So with that, the reliability goes up somewhat. And it's nothing more than ticking boxes. Uh, you will check, hey, does the picture correlate with the article? Does the headline correlate with the article or vice versa? That's so important because in this age of disinformation and misinformation and fake news, you will often see that information um, is partially true, but just broadly taken out of context, for instance. So to spread a different narrative than it was originally meant for or to get you to click on something, clickbait, so we use all those techniques So check the source, check the person, check the profile, check the profile picture, check the profile header. Can you reverse image search that picture and see where else you can find it? And if so, what does that tell you? What does that source now tell you about that piece of information? But not only about the news that we think, because also we talked about that. Well, just in a moment, you said, hey, I can write a piece of Python script. And within this course, we will teach you to write some Python script. But for me, more importantly, is I know a lot of open source intelligence people who rely on tools, mostly other people, their tools, mostly grab from GitHub, for instance, for free. But what people do not tend to do, or at least in my experience, is that they will grab a piece of code of someone that is capable of, for instance, scraping Snapchat or scraping Twitter. They will not do a code assessment. 
they will not do, hey, can I use this piece of software safely from an operation security perspective? Or is it leaking something? So that's something that I think is also part of the process of reliability rating. You can use someone else's tools, fine, but may, if, maybe you first want to check it, or maybe you want to check it if you can alter it for a different need that you may have. So yeah, that's so important when it comes to all of this. And not only yeah. that, so John does a lot of things on the dark web, for instance, in this course. He can tell you, you need to check a lot of things. So maybe you want to introduce yeah. a little bit of that? Uh, we, we go into that some of the course as well. Um, we, we discuss forums and marketplaces, both on the regular internet and on Tor and things like that. We kind of cover all the basic ground so that if you're not too familiar with investigations in these areas, you can get started and dig into it. Everyone that's doing these kinds of investigations is, is usually coming from different angles. So we try not to be too prescriptive in the course. We try and give you tools. We try and give you information and resources. Uh, like Nico said, you know, if, if we give you a tool, we also want you to be able to understand how it works, uh, like, like doing some code analysis. And we address that on the course as well. Using websites, it's it makes things easier but you also have to realize you're sharing information with some third party and do you or don't you want to do that and is that information reliable like nico said uh you know for most investigations context means an awful lot and if you don't have all that information and you're not sort of assessing it as you go along you can definitely go off in the wrong direction but we do cover some of that ground. We also dive into things like cryptocurrency, um, using tools like Blockchain Explorer to track Bitcoin transactions and all this sort of stuff. We try to um, try to to kind of. There's people I know that have been doing OSINT work for a while that have taken some fundamental courses and so on. But you know they're kind of looking to to go a little further or go into areas and understand things that they haven't worked with before. And a lot of what we're doing with this course is trying to address some of those things. I also yeah. think it's good to know that that people, um, it's a very hands-on course. So you'll mm -hmm. have a lot of hands-on lab time because honestly, I think the only way you can become a really good open source intelligence analyst is by doing it. Practice, 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 trial and error. Especially when you use someone else's tool, you need to first figure out how to install it, then use it, maybe not with your immediate target use case, just to stay on the safe side in, in case things break. So we will tell you that. And I think also when we talk about things that, for instance, David was really good at writing code, we will also often give you an alternative. So if you do not feel comfortable with, for instance, using JQ, you can maybe do it with uh, a shell command or something else. So it's for me, that makes it so much more powerful because I know for a lot of people who start out in open source, the command line can be very intimidating or using JQ can be intimidating. So I think that's something that's really good to know that there's more ways that lead to Rome and we will show you those roads in essence. Yeah, it's really about enabling people mm -hmm. to, yeah. to understand where they can go, where resources are, and also tools that they can use, or if they prefer other tools, you know, use those other tools, use what works for you. There's a lot of tools out there and we want to introduce some of the ones that we find workable and valuable uh, to everyone. And that's a great point. I mean, look, we understand not every environment is the same. And in the cases, you know, we send out a course VM that's based on Linux. And, but we realize, hey, a lot of people aren't running Linux as their daily driver at work. And that's, we, we understand that. So what we try to do is provide kind of that idea of there's pathways to get there. Um, and so whether you want to use a shell or you use a website or write some Python, uh, by the way, here's a couple different ways to get to that end that you need. And by the way, it all ties back in together, right? We're not teaching you Python because this, you think this is a programming course. We're teaching you because there's an OSINT objective at the end of the road there. And so whether it is using it to pull data, whether it's using it to leverage an API to pull down blockchain transactions so I can automate that. So I don't have to go and pull it every time I need it, but I can figure it out once, set it on a schedule and know that that data will be there for me. That's the power of automation. And how you get there really doesn't matter. Uh, again, we're just trying to give you a couple different examples. We certainly can't cover every possibility of what you'll do 
in the OSINT arena, but we're trying to cover common cases and let you start to think about how to build your own toolbox. And of course, a lot of that really comes back to how am I going to pivot from one data source to the next? So Nico is talking about looking, for example, at things like social media posts uh, for sentiment, who's talking about it. Well, that also ties in very closely to another topic we cover in the class related to sensitive groups and unique identifying labels. That's a major pivot point for us. If I can easily extract out all the accounts that are talking about something, now I start to have a better idea of where they may fall in the classification of them in a sensitive group. So Nico, maybe you want to pick up and run with that a little bit. Yeah, so sensitive groups is basically uh, something that I was really deep into in my times at the Dutch government. So I spent a lot of time tracking down terrorists, all sorts of terrorists. So left wing, right wing, jihadi, you name it, I've traced, or at least I tried to trace them. They didn't always be, it wasn't always successful, but at least I tried to. And with that, I noticed there's a need when you try to track a group to have a, a methodology, a process. So with that, I came up with that unique identifying labels concept. So if you can pinpoint a group that has a specific interest, for instance, to make fun of another group or to spread hate towards another group, you now have a unique identifying labels. What makes them unique? It could be a brand, could be a logo like I have on my shirt, could be uh, that most of the group are bald men, which is something that's very specific in OSINT. Uh, and John, you need to shave. And yeah. we have a lot of things going on that, that we can look at um, and name out. But also now that we have those unique identifying labels, we can pick them up again and, for instance, provide them in your own build search engine, which we provide you with in this course, to start monitoring, tracking those keywords in other places. In essence, to pivot off those and, in, and find more data that you may want to sort through and parse through and map out that entire group to come to the conclusion, hey, this may be the leader. This is where they hang out. They are teaming up with a different group or this is where we can find the victims. And if we know where the victims are, most likely we will find their adversaries because people will often be attacked where they are off guard or at least where they feel safe. So all those techniques, at least we try to address and, and, and point out to students in class saying, hey, if you're interested in finding persons, most likely persons are part of a group. And if you know how to find a group, you will most likely now be able to track them by using those unique identifying labels. And with that, you need tools, you need scrapers, you need monitoring. So again, everything ties back in the end to getting a complete course that gives you everything you need to take your open source intelligence skills to the next level. Yeah, absolutely. And we, you know, we didn't really harp on the monitoring part when we were talking about automating, but if you are doing investigations and groups like that, that is absolutely something you're going to be doing. You're not just going to go get grab information and leave it. You're typically going to be monitoring a group or something for some period of time. And that is really where some automation comes in handy because you can set things up. So, okay, there's a new post now. Great. Collect that and, and feed it right to me. Things like that. And again, it all ties together. We also look at, you know, how to create uh, identities, uh, sock puppets and things online. Uh, and some of the do's and don'ts about that, some of the tips, um, setting up communication channels and things like that. So all of this sort of works together and we've tried to um, make it really cohesive within this one course. Right. And that's a great point. I mean, as uh, you alluded to, John, I mean, social media is a major data source in the OSINT world, right? But we have gates there. So it may be I can't see posts without being authenticated uh, or maybe uh, trying to use the API is cost prohibitive, for example. Uh, you know, it's not particularly I don't think that there's not a free API for things like Twitter or other things like this. Um, and so really, we have to think about different ways to pull that data. And of course, if I'm trying to get into the operation or the mind of a particular group, um, it's better when I'm coming in as a like-minded person. And so having that ability to think about how I would create a plausible identity to go in and try to investigate this group, that's something we will touch on. I mean, that's, I would also kind of argue that's something that also evolves pretty quickly. We know the platforms tend to change. We know the platforms are actively looking for these types of things. And so that makes our jobs a little bit more difficult as investigators. But no matter what the result of our investigation, we're going to have data. 
And so how we manage that data, how we, how we analyze that data, how we put it together becomes very, very important. Uh, and so we, you know, we touch on those issues quite a bit. We talk about, okay, I've got this data and what do I do with it? Uh, but it's always with the mind of feeding into a process because you no know, OSINT is process driven. And so what is our process? Well, that's going to vary depending on who you are. Everybody's going to have their own unique process that suits their organization. Uh, and so we not necessarily trying to be prescriptive in that in that particular regards, but we do want you to think about, OK, here's something we describe as a process we think makes sense. Take it, adapt it, use it, you know, take what works, throw away what doesn't. It's all up to you. Yeah, I fully agree. Uh, I think looking at the time, um, it's good for us to to slowly start wrapping up. I see David raising his hand, trying to make another point. So go ahead, take it. Take oh no, 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 go ahead, Nico. That's fine. Yeah. So, I, so I think we've got a, a bit of time left, though. I think we're what uh, we got an hour for this stream. I thought it was 30 minutes, but uh, I don't know. But maybe someone can <laughs> let us know. From so uh, we will we will just discuss. So one question that that I'm keen on. Um, so what would be for you, for you uh, the thing that, that stands out most within this course that say, hey, that's my key takeaway for this course, uh, John? So what would be the thing that you enjoy the most in this course? I think what I really like about the course is how we have tied these things together, um, like I just mentioned, that we, we talk about different things. We talk about reliability ratings and investigating sensitive groups and dark web and cryptocurrency. We also talk about automation and creating tools that will help you monitor and track and do your investigations. And all of this ties together. And beyond that, it's very hands-on. We've created a bunch of labs so that you really, for me, I think it's important that people get hands-on and figure out how to do stuff. Uh, it's one thing to just have someone talking to you about how something's done it really sinks in, in my experience, when you actually go and do it. And this is something we've really tried to focus on with this course, um, because we are doing some, you know, advanced, this isn't all foundational stuff here. We're, we're working on some things that a lot of people don't necessarily deal with in their day to day, or some bits that they might once in a while. So we really want people to get some experience and get used to using these tools, doing some coding and scripting or, or analysis of of the tool code it's not super complicated you just kind of have to get the feel for it and 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 start working on it yeah i, I think in addition to that uh, uh, what you what you raised here it, it's advanced but we are purposely build it if you have no open source intelligence skills whatsoever mm -hmm. you should be able to follow along you may have a little bit of a hard time here and there because things may be a little bit too complex but everything was basically built to give you step-by-step -step instructions or instructions by us for us for you to understand and and that also kind of answers that question i saw pop in in the comments uh, someone asking how many hours a day is the course online it's it's six days of uh eight hours in essence um, with breaks in mind you will have effectively six to seven hours of teaching including lab times and sometimes you will have a lab that will have that will take 15 or 20 minutes but we also have labs that will take almost an hour for you to complete and on day six we have that final capstone event where you get to work together with a group of classmates to to yeah, basically figure something out which i'm not going to spoil that's that's i think that's the coolest part of this course you you get to put together everything you learned throughout the week with your fellow students and you'll do final presentations and well there's only one team that's going to win and uh, yeah so David, you you have something that you think is for you that key takeaway of this course? Sure. Well, I mean, for me, obviously, because a lot of what I worked on was related to the coding and the scripting and the automation and the fact that we were able to tie it into so many different parts of the course. Uh, that, I think that was really great. I think it was really a nice way of trying to show that there are opportunities for this throughout the course. And so if we're talking about cryptocurrency, yeah, you can go to this website, but by the way, if you wanna do it at scale, here's an API you can use. You're doing some investigation of vehicle traffic, whether it's maritime or airline, hey, there's APIs you can use. And so again, it all ties back to that foundational knowledge. And look, as I mentioned, we're not trying to make a coder. That's not really the goal of the course. The goal is to uh, think of it as uh, our friend, the Lego blocks, right? You have the capabilities, 
and we're just looking to give you some blocks you can stick together. You don't necessarily have to know how to make the block as long as you know how to put the blocks together and get it to build what you want. And so that's really the approach we take with uh, the coding side, the automation, the scripting, the Python. It's really all about how do I get to that objective most easily? So again, we're not going into computer science fundamentals of programming. That's not the intent here at all. It's intended to say, okay, even if you never code, I would like you to be able to look at a piece of code and have a pretty good idea of what it does. And if there are things you don't know what it does, at least you can narrow it down to the things you're not sure about. And so that I think is an essential skill to have because we talked about before, we are using tools written by the people almost all the time. And I wanna make sure that, especially in this age of supply chain attacks, and we've seen so many of them in the last 18 months uh, that we are aware of the risk of what we're using. We know what we're using. We're observing our operational security requirements and getting to be effective investigators. And so uh, there's a question here in chat and I'll address it real quick. Um, so uh, uh, the question here is how much of OSINT needs a PowerShell based approach? And look, again, for, for me, it's really not so much about the language you choose. I like to look at it from a perspective of what is the problem I'm trying to solve? And it may be able to solve it with a shell script. I could solve it with a DOS batch script, old school. I could do it in PowerShell. I could do it in Python. Now, the reason we chose Python in this course is because Python is cross-platform. So whatever we write typically is going to work on Mac, Linux, Windows, and work the same way. So that was our reason reasoning for choosing Python. And frankly, there's uh, some excellent tools out there already in the open source world that have already been written in Python that can be leveraged for OSINT. And so that was really the thought process there is that you're probably using some of these tools already. Now is your chance for you to actually pull the covers back and have a better understanding. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I think that's that's some for me uh, that also brings it for me to that for my key takeaway is, is really getting that good understanding of, hey, we have our, our own critical thinking that we constantly need to be successful in our more advanced open source and challenge technique because the more advanced we get, most likely you will start doing things at scale a little bit more. And you need to rely on tools. And those tools are, well, I think most of them are out there for free, but you now need to know what those tools are capable of and if you can trust those tools. And if you get information coming from those tools, now you need to do another part of critical thinking because you now you need to make that assessment on, hey, is the information that I collected reliable? And where's that coming from? And what does that mean to address that intelligence requirement? So for me, it would be, I, I would always, no, I, I don't even think that's fair to say, but it's we're almost indoctrinating you with critical thinking based upon everything that we do within open source challenge, but in a good way. I think it's so important to 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 keep your bias in mind when you get a data set or when you come across a data set. And if you parse through it, can you make sure that you will look at it from a, a that honest perspective and not trying to pick out cherry pick in essence? you can do some some word counting and see hey based upon that most likely there may be something off with this data set now let me take a deep dive on those partial words and see what that means within my investigation and maybe map it out graphically and all that kind of stuff so that's that's really important for me when we talk about uh this specific course in general yeah so um, there's one thing that, that, that I wanted to, to, to ask John uh, real quick here. So I know you are responsible for uh, a lot of the vehicle oriented stuff within this course. Um, can you tell me why this is so important within open source intelligence? Well, for me, I mean, my background as a private investigator, I did quite a bit of work with, you know, surveillance and following people and where are they and tracking them. Um, and some of that now is, is online. You can track airplanes, you can track uh, sailing vessels and things like that uh, in near real time. And that's kind of a powerful tool, whether you are tracking some individual that might be on an airplane or maybe you are doing security work for your company and you, um, you, you know, your, your company has vessels or something like that. There are tools out there and there are also so many opportunities to track and gather information using automation and setting up those monitoring systems and tools so that we can keep track of, of 
what's going on, whether you're doing geopolitical analysis and you're trying to find out why all these ships are stacking up in this uh, Strait of Gibraltar or whatever, um, or you're just tracking one individual that you happen to know has an, uh, an aircraft or a car even. Um, and there are differences, of course, in different countries as to what sort of information you can access. And we go into this in the course. But a lot of that data is out there. And this also is sort of that link between the physical real world of people and the internet kind of digital world. Um, which, you know, as a private investigator, that meant a lot to some people doing open source that maybe doesn't mean a whole lot. But for many investigations, you are looking at those connections between what people do online or what's available online and what's actually happening in, in the physical world, where they are and that sort of thing. Yeah. So Nico uh, and John, before I, I know we're getting probably close to the end of our time here. So I think maybe good maybe to talk about what you think is your favorite exercise from the course. You don't necessarily have to give away any spoilers here, but you know we put together quite a few uh, exercises uh, each day to supplement the material to give people extra time, and we've also put in bonus exercises as well. So. Um, Maybe I'll kick off here and describe that and you know, kind of tell you where I'm coming from. Uh, certainly, I think that uh, kind of one of our last exercises on the second day of the course related to doing data analysis of Python, where it shows us how we can take that data at scale, pull out things, transform it, save it in different formats, uh, really think about workflows where I can take data in one format. Maybe I pull data from an API, uh, pull it down, so it's in JSON format, take it, transform it into a single list, like a CSV that I can pump into another tool. And as we get that realized, like the power that gives you, the flexibility it gives you in your workflow to work efficiently, I think is a, a great takeaway. Um, so Nico, what do you think? What, did, what is your favorite exercise that you uh, know from the course? Uh, for me, it's a day five uh, exercise where we pull a bunch of Twitter data and we try to convert that into a, a graph. And that graph can help you pivot into, well, for instance, maybe a sensitive group. That's a lengthy laugh, but I think that's something that brings shows the real power of open source intelligence at scale. Yeah, definitely. June, John, how about you? For me, honestly, it's a little hard because we have so many great labs, I think, in this class. But one that sort of stands out to me is when we do on day four, we are doing an investigation in a lab into a ransomware uh, group, and we're tracking their Bitcoin transactions and finding out you know, what wallets they're using, how much money they're collecting, where it's ultimately going, and I think it's a really cool way of, of putting together some of the other stuff that we go over in the course from, from using tools like APIs to also just reliability of data, understanding the information, and then that analysis of the information. Yeah, that is a cool app, particularly for those who are, are well, and with the all time high of Bitcoin, it has, it has more momentum uh, now than ever, I guess. <laughs> So I think uh, that being said, we are uh, ready to wrap this uh, live session up. Um, I think uh, if you are interested in this course, just check it out. But if you are not interested, it's just worthwhile to read the syllabus and see uh, if maybe in the future you want to check it out. Um, I would like to thank you for you all who are in, uh, bringing comments, uh, saying hi, and, and participating here actively in our chat. Uh, we will take our time to go over them and reply to some of them uh, after this live session uh, by typing some answers in here. Um, any last words from you all, David? Uh, like I said, it's been a real, real treat developing this course, and you know we're very excited to share it with everyone. It's been a lot of work. Uh, to get we can share it. Yeah, but we think it's yeah. Uh, we think it's a really good course, and uh, you know we're proud to present it, and uh, hope that we'll see you at the course in the future. Yeah, uh, pretty much the same thing. Uh, we put a lot of work into this course uh, with the idea of people being able to learn and become better investigators and to use open source information uh, and to take their skills to the next level. That was the whole point of everything we've done with the course. And um, we look forward to uh, seeing you in class. Yeah, absolutely. And, and that being said, a thank you, everybody. If there are any questions, feel free to reach out to me on the Twitter spheres or whatever, 
or just try and find us using open source intelligence. Uh, there you go. There you go. <laughs> Thank you. Bye bye, everybody. Thanks, everyone.